Amen? Well, if you have a Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. I want to welcome you to the final week of the series that we have been in called Bless This Home. In this series, we have been discovering what Jesus says that we can do to have a blessed home. We all want to have a blessed home. We've already laid that foundation. We've already agreed that we all want to have a blessed home, but not everybody has a blessed home. And the reason is not because God doesn't want us to have a blessed home. God wants every home represented here to have a blessed home. Now, the reason that we don't have a blessed home is because those in the home are not doing the things that Jesus says will result in blessing. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus gives eight characteristics of those that are blessed. And so far in this series, uh, we've seen that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. Uh, we've seen that those who are pure in heart are blessed. Uh, we've seen that those who are peacemakers are blessed. And today we're going to finish this series by discovering that those who are persecuted because of righteousness are blessed. Here's the big idea today. A home that lives right will be a home persecuted by the world, but blessed by God. A home that lives right will be a home that's persecuted by the world, but blessed by God. Look with me at what Matthew writes in Matthew chapter 5. These are the words of the Lord Jesus, beginning in verse 10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of what? Because of me. Father, I pray that you would open up our hearts today. I pray that you would be our teacher. And I pray that we would realize that when we are persecuted because of Jesus Christ, it's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Help us to live in such a way as families, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When Jesus Christ is at the center of a home, that home, Jesus makes very clear, will be the center of persecution. People will mock that home. Uh, they will make fun of uh, and ridicule uh, that home. And in some places, they will do much worse to that home. Uh, we've not experienced that in our culture, but there are cultures where uh, some families in, end up losing their lives because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We live in a very unrighteous world. And so anytime a family makes the decision to hunger for righteousness... Anytime a, a, a family makes that decision, there is going to be a consequence. Uh, the world's going to mock that family. Uh, we live in a world that idolizes impurity. I mean, everywhere you turn in this world, it's one filthy thing after another. And so anytime a family makes the decision to be pure in heart, the people of this world are going to make fun of that family. We live in a world that is all about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a cheek for a cheek. So anytime a family makes a decision to be a peacemaker by turning the other cheek and forgiving as the Lord forgives and seeking the highest good for everyone, people of this world are going to insult that family. A home that lives right will be a home persecuted by the world but blessed by God. And that's, that's what Jesus is saying here. When we live in a way that Jesus wants us to live, our family is going to be harassed. Our family is going to be mistreated. Our family is going to be persecuted. So here's a question I want us to answer today. How do we prepare our homes for persecution? I mean, if we're living the way that, that God wants us to live, we will be persecuted. How do we prepare ourselves? How do we prepare our family for that persecution? What can we do to make sure our homes are ready 
for the inevitable persecution that will come when we choose to serve the Lord. The first thing I want us to understand today is we, we're going to be prepared. We have to expect it. The reason so often we're not prepared for something when it happens to us is because we're not expecting it to happen to us. Uh, anytime we expect something is going to happen to us, we take steps to prepare for it. For example, I expect that my family is going to want to eat. Anybody else have a family that likes to eat? Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're getting off pretty well. Let me just tell you. Uh, my family expects to eat. So every month I do something. Every month I set aside money in the budget for food. And every way, every week, we, and I say that very loosely because most of the time it's Melissa, uh, she goes and buys groceries. Why? Because we expect that our kids are going to get hungry. We expect that we're going to get hungry. And so uh, we prepare for that. When we expect something to happen, we do our best to prepare ourselves for it. Today's a classic example. I mean, earlier in the week, they were already saying that today was going to be you know, potentially uh, icy. And, and so, you know, I was already having a conversation. Oh, no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, last yesterday, I started kind of just, you know, having the conversation with myself and other people uh, because we, we were expecting this to happen. And so we tried to prepare for it. We tried to have a plan in place uh, so that we could be ready to meet today. So when you expect something is going to happen, you prepare for it. So when, when we anticipate that our families are going to be persecuted for righteousness, when we expect that's going to happen, we, we make preparations for that. Uh, you know, persecution is not something sometimes we anticipate. It's not something that we expect is going to happen to us. Right? I mean, persecution for the pastor's family, yes! But persecution for my family? No way. But Jesus says, yes way. But Jesus says that if you choose to live for him in this world, you can expect that you will be persecuted. I want you to listen to what Paul told Timothy as recorded in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. I'll be reading from the message paraphrase. It says, you've been a good apprentice to me. A part of my teaching, my manner of life, direction, faith, steadiness, love, patience, trouble, sufferings, suffering along with me and all the grief I had to put up with in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. And you also well know that God rescued me. Anyone who wants to live all out for Christ is in for a lot of trouble. There's no getting around it. Paul says to Timothy, I've suffered. I've suffered for following Jesus and, and you, Timothy, you have suffered alongside me. Now, I want to stop for just a moment. I want to share a few of the persecutions that Paul experienced. He was imprisoned on multiple occasions. I mean, if you read his letters, it, you know, it seems like that was just something he was very familiar with. He was in and out of prison quite often. Uh, five times he received 39 blows to his back with a whip. Now, that sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Why? Why did he experience this? Because he followed Jesus. Three times he was beaten with rods. He was stoned one time, and that just happened to be in Timothy's hometown of, of Lystra. And, the, and, and I, we could go on, but these are just a few examples of, of the ways that Paul was perse persecuted because of the way that he lived for Jesus. He made the way of Jesus his way of life, and as a result, he experienced persecution. And Timothy, he knew all about this persecution that Paul experienced. In fact, I would say that this was something that Timothy himself, he came to expect as he was Paul's apprentice. Now, I want you to notice what Paul wanted Timothy to understand. After mentioning his own persecution, Paul says this to Timothy, and, and you can't miss this today. Because, I mean, it's, it's one thing when we look at the Apostle Paul, right? I mean, we're like, yeah, I mean, he's this giant of the faith. I mean, we place him right up here. And, and I mean, we're like, yeah, man, like Paul, he's going to be persecuted. But notice what he says to Timothy and what he says to all of us. Anyone. Are you an anyone? 
I'm an anyone. I know that's not proper English, but forgive me today. He says, anyone who wants to live all out for Christ is in for a lot of trouble. And he says, there's no getting around it. If you want to live all out for Jesus Christ, you cannot get around being persecuted. It will happen, not just to Paul, not just to Timothy, but to all of us who want to live all out for Jesus Christ. And I would just say this today, what this world needs a little bit more of is the church living all out for Jesus Christ. Amen. But just expect when we begin to do that, we will experience persecution. When you pray before eating, eating lunch at school, if you, if you make that decision to do that, young people, there's going to be those that make fun of you. Expect it. When you're 18 years old and still a virgin, people are going to laugh at you. Expect it. When you tell the coach that, that your kid won't be at the game because uh, they're going to be at church, and I know there are exceptions, and you've heard me say from this pulpit that we don't want to be legalists, but there are times where you have to draw a line in the sand and you have to say, no, my kid is going to church. When you do that, people are going to ridicule you. They expect it. When you refuse to bend the rules just a little bit at work, I mean, I mean what's it going to hurt? It's just a little bit. When you say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bend the rules at all. Guess what? When you, when you make the choice to do that, people are going to mock you. Why? Because it's not the way of the world. The way of the world is to bend the, world, the rules. The, the way of the world is not to wait till marriage. The way of the world is not to pray. And so anytime you hold to a godly standard that goes against the cultural norm, you will be persecuted, expected. It's something that's always happened to those who stand up for the truth and, and live for righteousness. Jesus says this in Matthew 5, verse 12. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And that's so important to remember. This has been going on a long time. This is nothing new. Those who have chosen to, to follow Jesus and to live all out for him, they have always been persecuted and they always will be. And Jesus says, rejoice and be glad that you can be counted among the prophets who were persecuted in such a way. So the first thing that we need to do if we're going to prepare our home for persecution is to expect it. I mean, it's good to have that conversation in your home. When you're teaching your children what's right, what's wrong, it's important to remind them, listen, as you do what Jesus wants you to do, as you live for him, understand that you can expect that you will be persecuted. We don't want our children to be in for a surprise. We want them to understand up front that when they choose to follow Jesus, they will be persecuted. Second, we can expect it, but we, we, we can also prepare ourselves by enduring it. Paul wrote these words to the believers in Corinth as recorded in 1 Corinthians 4.11. He says, To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty and are poorly clothed and are roughly treated and are homeless. All of these words, hungry and thirsty and, and poorly clothed and, and, and roughly treated, homeless, they are all written in present tense. You say, well, is that a big deal? Yeah, because it emphasizes that all of these activities were something that Paul and his, and his companions experienced day in and day out. Day in and day out. I want you to notice how Paul says that he, is, he and his companions responded to this daily suffering and persecution. Verse 12 of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, and we toil working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we, we bless. When we are persecuted, what's he say? We endure. When we're persecuted, we endure. I, I love the meaning behind the word endure. It means to hold up. It means to hold oneself upright and straight. 
Paul says when we are persecuted, we don't fall down. We don't bend down. We don't, we don't bend over in defeat. No, when we're persecuted, we stay upright on our feet with our head up, moving toward the goal of being more like Jesus day after day. That's what Paul says we should do when we're persecuted. You know, so often when we're persecuted here in our culture, we don't endure it. Because number one, we don't expect it. But we don't endure it. So often, the first sign of hardship, the first sign of suffering, we put our head down, and what do we do? We give up in defeat. We need to be more like Paul. We need, we need to be more like his companions. Understanding that the goal will never be reached and the prize will never be won unless we're willing to hold ourselves upright and straight in the midst of persecution. I remind you again that Jesus says... In Matthew 5, 12, that when we are persecuted, we should rejoice and be glad because our reward is, in heaven is great. Never lose sight of that. God is watching. And one day, He will reward all of us accordingly to the way that we live our life here on this earth. And if we're willing to endure persecution, the Bible says very clear, it doesn't say everybody will receive the reward. It says those who endure will be the ones who will receive the reward. And, it, and I love how it says it. It says it'll be great. Don't you want to be counted among those who receive such a reward? The only one way it's going to happen is when we endure. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 12. It's a wonderful verse. We're going to get to it in just a second, but let me just tell you, to win the prize... To win the race, we have to endure persecution. To win that prize, we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. Um, that's the picture I get in my mind when I think of Paul, when I think of his companions enduring persecution. I see, I see them standing straight up, tall with their eyes fixed ahead on Jesus. Listen to what Hebrews chapter 12, beginning of verse 2 says. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy before him, what did he do? He endured. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you would, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The best remedy for not growing weary and losing heart in the midst of persecution is to keep our eyes fixed on the cross of Calvary. There we see Jesus enduring the cross. There we see Jesus scorning its shame because he saw past the pain. He saw past the suffering of the cross to the joy of the throne of God where he would welcome us to come with confidence so that we may receive mercy, so that we might find grace to help us in our time of need. When we fix our eyes on Jesus and the cross, it emboldens us to say, if Jesus can endure it, I mean, if Jesus can endure that, I can endure this. So we need to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. And what he did for us. And how he endured. How he ran the race all the way to completion for us. And how we should run the race all the way to completion for him. Again, Hebrews 12, 2 says that Jesus is the author, and he's the perfecter of our faith. You know, we don't, we don't want to hear this, but we need to hear this. One of the things that Jesus Christ uses to perfect our faith is persecution. Faith is perfected in persecution. Someone once said this, a faith that has not been tested cannot be trusted. And guess when our faith is tested the most? During times of persecution. He is the author and he is the perfecter of our faith. That's what the word of God says. And God will use our pain. He will use the adversity in our life. Because in those times we learn eternal truths that we would not learn otherwise. 
Listen, we learn some things about our God that we would never learn. We, we learn, we, let me back up. I got ahead of myself. We learn some things about our God in the midst of pain that we would never learn about him when things were going great for us. I mean, when, when, do you, when do you learn that God is that comforter? When do you learn that God is that refuge, that he is that strong tower? It's in those difficult times of life. It's in those times of persecution, trials and tribulations that we, that we learn those truths about our God. And God uses that to perfect our faith. So how do we prepare our homes? How do we prepare our homes for persecution? Number one, we expect it. Number two, we endure it. Finally, we embrace it. When you embrace someone, you hold them close. I love to embrace my wife. She's ready for me to move on. <laughs> when you embrace somebody, you do this. You hold them close to you. It's a sign of welcome. It's a sign of acceptance. And that is how we should respond when we are persecuted for doing what is right in the sight of God. We should embrace it. We should welcome it. We should accept it. You see, when our homes are persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ, it means something. It means something. It means that we have welcomed Jesus Christ as Lord of our heart, Lord of our home, and that we are part of his kingdom. It means that we are actively living our life to advance his kingdom, that we are actually living out our faith and not just saying we have faith. And there is a difference. You realize that. There is a difference between saying you, you have faith and actually living out your faith. God wants us to live out our faith. And when we live out our faith, we are going to experience persecution, but we should embrace it because it means we are actually living for Jesus. That he is Lord of our lives. Notice again what Jesus says in Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Persecution should not be viewed as something strange. It should not be viewed as something abnormal for the Christ follower. follower. Persecution is a normal way of life for those who follow the way of Christ. Peter said it this way. In 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory in God rests on you. Verse 16 continues, But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God. God in his name. The Bible is clear that we should embrace persecution. I want you to listen to this in Acts chapter 5. Peter and the apostles, they're thrown into prison. They're told, don't you, you know, you all quit teaching about Jesus. You stop that. Don't you teach about Jesus. We don't, we don't want to hear about it. Let me, let me ask you something. Does that sound familiar? You all, you all stop talking about Jesus. You, you all stop teaching about his truth. We're warning you. What they do? They went right out. They kept teaching. And they kept proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. They, they flogged them. Listen to this. Acts chapter 5. Beginning in verse 40. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them, ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. And so what did they do? Did they, did they, they hang their head and defeat, bend over, walking away? No, no, they stood upright. They walked out of that prison. They walked out of that meeting. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And we should do the same. 
We should count it all joy that we get to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ in this culture that is becoming more and more godless day after day. And every day, the Bible says, in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching, preaching Jesus as the Christ. I love that. If your home is being persecuted because of the name of Christ, you should wear it as a badge of honor. Rejoice that your home is participating in the sufferings of Christ. Praise God that the name of Jesus Christ is written above the doorframe of your home. I'm going to close with a couple of quotes that I came across that I think are so very important for us to realize and remember. First of all, Paul Chappell said this. The devil doesn't persecute those who aren't making a godly difference in the world. If you're not making a godly difference in the world, you're going to be left alone. The world's not going to persecute you. You have no concern to them. And I want to tell you, you start living for Jesus and you start living out your faith and, and living for righteousness and doing what is right, understand you will be persecuted. And John Rice said this, the world never burned a casual Christian at the stake. And the world never will. It's only those people who are on fire for Jesus that have ever been burned at the stake. I just want you to know, church, if you, if you have not noticed, we live in a post-Christian culture. There was a day and time when the church was celebrated, the church was welcomed, the teachings of Jesus Christ were welcomed. That is no longer the way it is. It's not going back. We are going to be persecuted more and more and more as we stand on the truth of Jesus Christ. We need to understand it. We need to expect it. We need to endure it. We need to embrace it when it happens. That's what Jesus wants us to do. People ask, I remember when I started to have children, aren't you scared to bring your children into this world? Why would I be scared to bring my children into a world that Jesus has overcome? Amen. Greater is he who's in my children than you. All of you who call yourselves Christian, greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. Praise be the name of Jesus Christ. So no, it doesn't scare me at all. For he has chosen for whatever reason for all of us to live at such a time as this. We could have been born at any other time in the world, but he chose for us to be born here and now because he has a purpose for our life. He has a way for us to, to walk and to live. And listen, may we embrace it fully for his glory. So do you want your home to be blessed? Understand, you have to be willing to be persecuted. As you do what's right, it's going to happen. And it isn't just young people, it's all of us. We're all faced with decisions day in and day out. The Word of God says, choose you this day who you're going to serve. And every day it's a choice, isn't it? I just encourage you to make the choice that, that Joshua made. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Men, may we lead our families that way. Women, may we lead that way as well. Children, may we be supportive of our parents who want to lead us in the ways of Jesus Christ. May we say, thank you, Mom. Thank you, Dad, that you love me enough, that you want me to know Jesus, that you want me to follow him. It takes all of us working together as a, as a family unit. So I just want to encourage you. Live for Jesus. And as you do, your home will be blessed by God. You'll be persecuted by the world, but you'll be blessed by God. Why is it so important that we come and do what we do every single week in this place? Because of what happens outside there. The walls of this place. 
Bible says that we should not give up meeting together. Especially as the drawing of Jesus Christ is, 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 is coming. His coming is drawing near and near every day. And the Bible says because of that, things are going to get harder for the church. And so this is why this is so important that we come together and remind one another what, what our life is to be about. And encourage one another in the faith. We're not here to beat one another up. Now, I know that happens in churches, but this is not one of those churches, right? We're not here to beat one another up. We're here to hold one another up. That's why it's important to be here. That's why it's important to come together week in and week out so we can be encouraged in our walk with Jesus Christ. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. If you're here today and you have never trusted in Jesus Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to make that decision today. The Bible says that all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. We were all born in this world, enemies of God by nature. And because of that, we deserve judgment. The Bible goes on to tell us that the wage of sin is death. But it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says that God demonstrated his own love for us in this way. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you look at the cross, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see Jesus taking your place. Because that's what it's all about. We deserved, we deserved to die. But Jesus said, I will go as the perfect substitute. I will go, the one who is sinless, I will go and I will lay down my life on the cross in death for their sin. That's what he did. <clears throat> Jesus shed his blood so that we could be forgiven of all of our sin. There's only one way that any of us could be saved, and that is by accepting that Jesus Christ died for us, that he took our place, that he shed his blood. That he died, that he was placed in tomb, but three days later he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Let me ask you today, have you ever confessed Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Has there ever been a time in your life where you have received Christ and Christ alone for your salvation? If not, would you just, right where you're at, would you just pray this prayer right where you're at? I believe, Jesus, I believe you came to this earth to be my Savior. Today I confess that you died on the cross in my place. Shed your blood so that I could be forgiven of my sin. Today I place my faith and trust in you alone for my salvation. I surrender to you as my Lord. Help me to lead our home to live right. I love you, Jesus. And I'm thankful that you first loved me. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Is there anyone here today who for the very first time just prayed that prayer along with me? If that's you, I want to ask that you do something right where you're at. Would you just look up your hand? Anybody here today who would say, Pastor Travis, I prayed that prayer with you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you're here. Thank you. Anybody else? In just a few moments, we're going to have a time of invitation. I would just encourage you, if you made a decision, and I know it's difficult, but as I say every week, the life of faith is all about living each day, letting people know that we're following Jesus. And today is your first opportunity to do that. So if you just prayed that prayer, again, no one's going to force you to do this. But if you just prayed that prayer, I would invite you in just a few moments to, to walk the aisle and let me know and let this church know. I saw your hand. God saw it. That's what matters the most. Maybe you just want to take the person by the hand next to you and say, I prayed. Would you walk down with me? He'll do that. Heaven's rejoicing right now in your decision. We just want to rejoice with you. We want to help you along in your journey. Father, I pray now for everyone who has a decision to make. I thank you for those who raise their hand. 
who trusted in you just now. I thank you that they passed from death to life. I thank you that their, their future, their eternity is with you. And I pray that you would help them from this day forward to live for you. Father, help them in just a few moments to be able to step out and, and to walk this aisle so that all of us can just rejoice with them. I thank you that heaven is rejoicing right now. Father, I realize there's other decisions that need to be made today. As you're leading, I pray that you would just help people to know exactly what you would have them to do, the next step that they need to make during this time of invitation. And Father, as the altars are open, I pray if people have burdens, they just need to come and lay down, that they would do that. Holy Spirit, just do the work that only you can do. May you be present. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing, I'm going to invite you to come right now. Don't wait. Be the first one to come right now. Let me be the same. to do except to receive him as the payment for our sin and uh, it's finished and we can rest in it can't we Eric and Misty come on up here 
I know most of you probably feel like you already know them, they're part of the family. Uh, but they have come today. And let me just say this. Sometimes we wonder if what we do makes a difference. We have all kinds of things from, you know, activities that we do as a church, uh, from the live nativity to trunk or treat. You're looking at a family who first came into this building the night of trunk or treat. God used that in their life. I, they have been here almost every, I think almost every Sunday since. Um, they come faithfully on Wednesday nights as well. And like I said, I already feel like they're part of the family, but they want to make it official uh, today. This is Eric and Misty Whitland. Uh, they're both coming uh, by statement of faith. Uh, Eric uh, desires to be uh, baptized, and so we're going to make plans to do that in the coming days as well. So if you promise that you're going to love them, and you're going to encourage them in their faith, and just be the brother and sister in Christ that they need you to be, would you just let them know by just saying amen, and then give them a great big hand. Amen. Amen. So uh, they're going to be out there, so you can officially welcome them into the church family. So I'm going to let you get started, because you've seen how they are. They, they like to get out of here, so I'll give you a head start. Tonight, we'll be back at uh, 6 o'clock, uh, getting close to finishing our millennial study. We are uh, very close to finishing that up. We've got a couple more. Uh, we want to be a church that reaches every generation.